Hello and welcome everyone. It is Fast Kareem here with Learn It. And I want to present you Excel 2021 expert. As we all know, on October 5th, Microsoft released the latest version of their Office products. And a lot of organizations had the opportunity to upgrade if they hadn't already subscribed to Office 365. And with these new iterations of these tools that we get to use, especially with Excel, there's a wide new set of features and functions that they release that simply make our lives easier when using Excel. So in this next hour, an hour and a half or so, we will be covering quite a bit new functionalities, new functions, and some old ones. Talk about the enhancements they have for them. Let me show everyone the topic list that we have in store. Now, in this course, we're going to focus, it's a pretty expert, I mean, we call it expert, but it's pretty focused on functions, on advanced database functions. We're going to start right off learning about nesting, how to put functions together. And from there, learning about the basic database functions like sum if and average if. And right after that, we start getting into some interesting topics where interesting, I mean, new. Microsoft released an XLOOKUP. VLOOKUP still there, but XLOOKUP is, alleviates a lot of those small little rules and guidelines we have to follow when filling out the VLOOKUP. Things about the lookup value having to be a place a certain area. Things about your range lookup having to be set to true or false depending on your exact match mode. A lot of that's been alleviated for us. There are also some really cool array functions that I just want to spend some time talking about the unique sort, sort by, and filter functions, where I have a wide variety of examples that we're going to go through uh, using these functions to find a unique list, to sort a list, to sort a list by a particular column of values, or to filter a list. Now, towards the end, we're going to start learning about some other advanced functions, one of them being let. And that essentially allows us to build aliases within functions. We have a value, we can give it a name. And we can reuse that name in other parts of the formula. Now, once we cover functions, I do want to talk about some functionalities and commands that we have, like the consolidate tool. It's been there for quite a while, but it's a good little refresher that we'll talk about when we use it and how we can use it. And we will wrap up this session talking about macros, a quick intro to them, how you can turn on the developer tab, how you can record your first macro and run your first macro. Very interesting course here. I do consider these expert topics or advanced topics. I do want to mention, if you are enjoying these videos, be sure to hit a like and a subscribe if you don't mind. Now keep in mind, if you are looking to earn any certificates and watch videos without any ads, sign up for Learn It anytime. That's our dedicated online training subscription service at Learn It. You can check the link in the description for more information if you're interested. Now, if you do have any questions you want answered by me, Faz, or any other of our instructors, don't forget to join Offsite. It's a great community. I'll have the link for that inside the description as well. And now, as always, Keep in mind, if you do need to download the exercise files to this course so that you want to practice and get a little hands-on with these topics that we're covering, you'll find them in the video description as well. So I am pretty excited here to get started. We're going to be covering Excel Expert with these set of topics. Don't forget to download the exercise file inside the description before we get started. But let's start. I'm going to go ahead and open up my exercise file and begin. I'm over here inside of the Excel workbook that's provided with the course, and I'm looking at a particular worksheet right now. I'm looking at a worksheet called if function. It's the very front of the workbook. So if you've opened the workbook and you notice you're not on the front, make sure you're on the if function worksheet before you do begin. But let me start by describing what I'm looking at here. Because I'm actually looking at some sales data from February of 2021. And it's tracking these weekly sales from all of our salespeople that we have. 
and it's calculating all their totals. And it looks like we found some metrics here about the biggest sale, the smallest sale. And whoever designed this sheet is actually using it to figure out whether or not these salespeople have met their quota and have reached the monthly goal of 34,000. Now, depending on whether or not they do reach that goal, these salespeople do get a 5% bonus. And this is all done using the if function where they're comparing two cells. And depending on if the answer is true, it's gonna say one thing in a cell and depending on if the answer is false, it's gonna say something else inside of the cell. Very common function we use in Excel. But on this sheet here, I have one example left that I haven't filled out. And it's asking me to check whether or not the department, this is our department here, has reached and met the qualifications for the $850 bonus per person. Now there are two qualifications they have to meet. Everybody has to have a total sales of 200,000 and they have to have both. The group as a whole has to have 9,000 or more per week in sales. So an average of 9,000 or more per week in sales. Now in order to solve this, this is another if where we put an equal sign in the cell and we type in the letter I and I'm just gonna click tab to fill in the rest of the function. We'll be doing that for most of our functions today. But the if function essentially allows us to do three what they call arguments. The logical test that checks whether something can either be true or false. And if it ends up being true, we have a value if true argument that we can fill out and a value if false. Now this logical test will only let you compare one thing. So right now this department as a whole must have a total sales of at least 200,000 greater than or equal to 200,000. That's filled up my, my position for the argument. So the if function only allows me to do one logical test. In fact, if I try to do another one, and I end up putting the word pass if it's true, and the word fail if it's false, if I end up doing this, it's gonna give me a message saying, says you've entered too many arguments because the if function expects three and here I am giving it four to four arguments. So I want to introduce a concept known as nesting where instead of actually putting in the argument that you have, like the logical test argument, we're going to replace that with another function. This function that I want to talk about is called AND. It checks whether all the arguments are true and returns true if all of the arguments that you put inside of the function are true. So it allows us to do multiple logical tests. It allows us to do multiple of those things that the IF function needs. So if I go ahead and compare this cell, the F12 is greater than or equal to 200,000. I can hit comma and my and function will allow me to continue and do another logical test. I can close out the and function parenthesis and now I've completely filled out a logical test with two arguments in it, but in the eyes of Excel, it sees it as one. I'm gonna hit comma here and now for the value if true, I'm gonna put the word pass and hit comma here. And since these are words, which we call strings, they have to be put in quotes. 
and I'm going to close the final parenthesis there. So now that I have my three arguments, I have my big old logical test that I've nested. They call this nesting. And I have my pass argument. And if anything doesn't pass, it'll give me the fail. So I've satisfied all the requirements, including mine, of having both of those logical tests to determine whether or not they've met the total sales and the average sale requirement. Now, if I were to hit enter here, I'm going to see that it says fail simply because of the fact that I did not breach my average sales of 9,000. However, though, I do want to mention, I'm going to go into this formula. And inside the formula, I'm going to zoom in here. Instead of using an and, we can replace it with an or. And the or will just check if one argument is true. So if one of these are true, it will still determine what the pass. That's the or. But if we switch this back to the and that we originally had, it actually needs to see both of these true. Otherwise, it's going to give a fail. I do recommend you give this a try. Here, I'll leave the formula on the screen if you want to pause the video here. Try out the formula. See if you can do it without actually copying the formula so you can figure it out logically. And if you need a little guidance, come back to the screen and take a poke at it. And once you've filled it out, go ahead and press play and we'll talk about some more database functions now that we're getting in the mindset of filling out functions, learning the syntax of how to do that in Excel. Go ahead and have fun. Don't forget to come back. Now, just to get started with this expert session, I want to start talking about some database functions that we've always had. I'm over here looking at these quarter one expenses for, yet again, the pair company, where we're tracking all the divisions and all the categories and how much our total expenses were. Now, I want to use this sheet to figure out and look up my total expenses for all of the software that I've been purchasing. Let's start out with that. So I actually want to sum up the total expense every time I see the word software going down this entire table or list of information. Now, I want to sum this up if it's in the category software. So let me use a very known function. I'm going to put an equal sign in here. Anytime we use a function, we have to use an equal sign, but I'm going to use a sum if. This is actually going to add cells specified by a criteria or a condition that I choose. Lucky for us, there's only three arguments that I have to fill out. A range, a criteria, and an optional argument. It's in brackets, it means optional. A sum range, the values you want added. Now I do admit it's only optional when the range itself are numerical values, but in my case it's not. So I get to essentially give Excel a range of options that I can search through. So I wanted to search through my entire category column. And I'm gonna do that using keyboard shortcuts I'm going to use the keyboard shortcut control, shift, and a down arrow to select the entire column for myself really easily. You never know how large these things are. Great. So I end up getting the range. That's the list of all of my possible options. And then I hit comma to move over the syntax to search for criteria. That's what I want next. And when I end up clicking on the cell that holds the criteria I want, I14, it selects that as the criteria. Now it ends up specifying what column or what values do you want me to sum. 
once I find this value, the criteria value, category, software. And in our case, we want to do the total expenses. Now keep in mind, practice your shortcuts here. Control, shift, and a down arrow. That will go ahead and grab the entire column or it will grow until it meets a blank. Nice. So it looks like we do have all three of our arguments filled out. Where we have a range, a list of all possible options. We have a criteria, it's kind of covered now, but the word software is in there. And then we have something we want to sum up. So there's quite a bit going on here, three things going on here. And if I were to hit enter, it's going to go ahead and show me that I've spent about 17 grand on software in quarter one. Now, of course, I'm a big fan of these keyboard shortcuts. If you wanted to add the dollar sign there, you can do that by hitting control shift in the number four. It'll change the, the, the data type of the cell to currency or accounting. So if I go over to my home tab, you'll see that it's now at currency. You know, before you practice this, I want you to see how similar these database functions are. Because in this next example here below it, I actually want to find the average cost for rent. So I want to find the average of the total expenses if, if it's in the category rent. So there's another formula that's very similar in nature known as average if. I'm going to hit tab here and the average if essentially returns, well it asks for three things, same three things that we asked for last time, but it returns the average of the expense. So this time my range is going to be the category again, control, shift, down, comma, and of course, my criteria this time, it's going to be I, 20. You're going to have a hard time clicking on that cell. It's covered. But I can still type the word I, 20, and it'll get picked up. And I can go ahead and hit comma here, and I can select the total expenses. I'm going to close this parenthesis here. This time, I'm going to hit Control Enter so that it puts the value into the cell without leaving the cell. The green cell address box doesn't move down when you hit control enter. Now I can hit control shift four to quickly add the currency format to that value. Doing good, doing good. I still have one more to show you. And that's this top example where I'm saving for last because I wanna look up the expenses for my category software if it's in the East division. So I essentially want to return this one single value. In this cell here, but we will just pretend that we didn't see it right there. We'll pretend that it was hidden. Another example of using the sum if is using some ifs with an S at the end. This allows you to do a set of conditions or criterias. It's kind of backwards now. It's going to ask for the total expenses first. I'm going to hit control shift down. And when we hit comma to move over to the next argument, that's where it starts asking for the first range, the first list of options, and the criteria you're looking for. So I'm going to pick the first range as division, control shift down the entire column. And when I hit comma, I can select the criteria to be east, I8. And now when I hit comma here, I have a range number two that I can fill out with a criteria number two afterwards, which will be for my categories. And I believe that is J8, since it's covered by a virtual wall. I'm going to have to type it in, J8. If I were to go ahead and hit enter here, I guess I already left the currency format for this one. 
Notice how Enter moved down a cell this time. If I would have hit Control Enter, it would have stayed on the same cell. But now I got that one value spitting out as my total expense for software in the East Division. So these are database functions. And up next, we're going to learn about the XLOOKUP database function. But I do want you to pause the video and give this a try. I want you to try filling out these three database functions. If you're wondering what the names of these are, the first one was sum if, average if, and the final one was sum ifs. Go ahead and give this a try and don't forget to come back. We'll talk about the x lookup function. So I'm over here on a worksheet that I've labeled as x lookup. And I'm going to zoom out just a bit because it's a master list of employee information that is listed on this sheet and on the top is a lookup. Now I've already done one single lookup where I've actually used a employee's ID number to retrieve their last name, Smith. Now in order to do this, I used a VLOOKUP where with the VLOOKUP, I used a lookup value, an employee ID, and I used a table array to search through, and I returned the second column of the table array with an exact match. That's a VLOOKUP. There's a lot of little rules that we have to remember. But it's been around for quite some time where I can actually use a lookup value. The thing about the lookup value is it has to be in the very first column of the data. Otherwise, the VLOOKUP doesn't work. So now that I have the lookup value, let me highlight the data known as a table array. Control shift to the right and control shift down. Now it's going to ask for what column I actually want returned. And in our case, well, in my case, I want to return the last name. That's column number two based off the highlight that we have. So if we can't add any more columns or rows now, because as soon as I add in a new column, it's going to move all my column index numbers. And then I have to actually add in false, otherwise it defaults to true. And it'll find an approximate match. So that's a VLOOKUP. It works, but there's a lot of rules to it. So instead, what they released, I'm going to delete this now, is an XLOOKUP function for all Office 365 subscribers and now Office 2021 subscribers as well. And I believe Office 2019 also has this one. So if I do an equal and I type in XL, I'll see the X lookup function pop up from my database of functions that I have. And when I click on it, it's actually going to show me the arguments that I need to fill out. There are six of them. But the last three are optional parameters that we don't need to fill out every time. Now, the very first argument is very similar to the VLOOKUP, where it looks for a lookup value. But this time, it doesn't matter if the lookup value is located in the middle of the table, in the first column of the table, at the end of the table. It just does not matter. There's no rule or guideline for that. But it will ask you for once you do choose a lookup value to actually highlight the column it can use to search through to find that lookup value. So I'm going to actually highlight this first column. Control shift down. So I've given it a lookup value and I've also given it a column to look through to find the lookup value. So it will find this value in the first position of the column. That's what's going to happen. It's going to find it in the in, inside of A10. The first position is A10. Now, when you hit comma, it's going to ask for a return array. What column do you want me to return with the matching row value? So if it found row number one, what column of row one do you want me to return? Do you want me to return the last name, 
the first name, department, so on and so forth. But in my case, I wanted last name. And if I go ahead and close the parentheses right here, I've already filled out all three of the required arguments. This will do exactly what my VLOOKUP did, and it'll return an exact match of Smith. I know, it gets exciting. I'm sure we all appreciate this much more than the VLOOKUP. But let's do another example here. Because what if we have an employee ID that doesn't exist? This NA. That means not available. So if I do a X lookup here, and I use this as a lookup value, it will never find it in this list. And it will never return a first name because it will never find one. But there is a argument that's optional called if not found that I can write not in the list. It will return that phrase if it doesn't find a match. I also can do a different match mode. By default, it'll do an exact match, but there are exact match or the next smaller item with a negative one. Or you can put a one for an exact match or the next larger item compared to the lookup value. And you can also do a number two for a wildcard character match, where you put a star or a question mark or a tilde for a certain amount of characters that you're searching for that you don't really know what the characters are. You'll see more about wildcards in my Excel 2021 XLOOKUP video as well, where we'll compare XLOOKUP and VLOOKUP together. For this one, I'm going to put exact match the default. And if I ever needed to, I can have the search start from the top or the bottom of the list, or even do a binary search. By default, it's a first to last there. I'm going to go ahead and close out this parenthesis. And that's actually an X lookup with all six of the arguments filled out. We'll do one more for good keeping here. The department X lookup. But this time, before I do it, I'm going to change it back to the employee ID 1054. Now my lookup value, of course, is my employee ID. It doesn't matter what I use for the lookup value, as long as it's a unique value. And now I have to specify where it can find it from. Control-Shift-Down. I'm going to hit comma here. And now, of course, my return array is my department column, which will return the corresponding row value number one, which is AT. And I'll just close the parenthesis here now that we've covered the other three optional arguments. And I'll hit enter and get AT. I do want you to pause this video. Here, I'll go over to my formulas tab and turn on show formulas. And I want you to practice filling out the X lookup. And I also want you to see if you can find me a pay rate using X lookup as well. Don't forget to come back though once you practice this. We still have a lot more new things to cover. All right, if you've just opened up this workbook and you've jumped around in the description of topics, we are in the unique worksheet currently. And in Excel 2021, they've released a new function called unique. And I wanna run through a few examples of using unique with the first one being a very simple one. I actually have a table of information here tracking all these customers and certain services they received for their automobiles on a certain date. Now I just want to figure out who in this list is a one-time customer, meaning they haven't done more than one service. Maybe I can contact them to do another service, see what's going on with them. Now, in order to do that, I previously would have to do it in multiple steps, but I now have a function known as unique, which actually looks through an array or a range and returns the unique values from it. I'm going to go ahead and pick the customer name column here for the array. 
And when I hit comma, it's going to ask for the by column argument. Return all unique columns from the array. Return all unique rows. I'm just going to skip that argument. Because I want to fill out the exactly once argument. Both of these are optional. But the exactly once, if I set this to true, will return all the items that only showed up once, exactly once in that list. If I close this out here and hit enter, I'll see that there's three people that I can contact, see if they need any or additional services, since they've only been a one-time customer in this list. Now these are known as array functions. In this version of Excel, we no longer have to hit control shift enter to control the spill. But in older versions with array functions, they previously called them control shift enter functions sometimes when I would go through an array of values to find out the calculation. Give this a try, pause the video, give this a try and we'll move on to another example of unique coming up soon. Another example of unique is having a concatenation conjoined into it. I'm going to go to the unique concat sheet, and I want to show you how I can build a list of unique full names using the unique function. I'm first going to select the first names here from my table, and then I'm going to add an ampersand. And inside of quotes, I'm going to add a blank space. And I'm going to find the last name here. If I close this out and I hit enter, it'll give me a unique list of full names. I do want you to pause this video. But when we come back, I do want to show you another example of unique where we're going to compare values all right, I'm going to jump gears here to another page, still on the unique function, but I'm going to jump to unique compare. I'm going to use a keyboard shortcut for that. I'm just going to hit control and page down to go to unique compare. And I can actually use the unique function yet again on both the region and the salesperson to give me the unique items from both of the columns. So here I only see two salespeople, part of one region, and I'll return the north region salespeople there for me. Pause the video. I do want you to try this one out as well. And I have one more example of unique, which will also use a sort function that we're going to do a deep dive on in just a second. Go ahead and practice this here. Now, one tool that we have available is the ability to nest. We can nest functions. And we can actually build, let me delete this here, I've already added it in. But I can build a sorted list by using the sort function. And with this sort function, I can go ahead and select the unique values from this list. And I can close out the parentheses here. So now this is a sorted list. If I wanted to change the sort order, of course, I'd have to go to the top and add in. We're going to learn about this in just a second. But the sort order would have to be changed to a negative one. Now, if you haven't practiced these four formulas yet, I do want you to pause the video and give these a try. And come right back. Don't forget to come back. So we're going to learn a little bit more about that sort function that we just got a sneak peek of in the unique sort example. Welcome back. We've just covered the unique function. We went through four different examples of it. Up next is the sort function. And I want to talk about three, well, technically four, we just covered the unique sort. I want to talk about three different examples of using sort or sort by to sort a list or a range of values. I'm actually looking at this small list of information where it's tracking regions, 
sales reps, products, and units. And I want to sort this information based off the units sold. Now I actually can do that by using, I'm gonna put a space here, the sort function. I can select the entire list and then I can use the sort index to choose what column I wanna sort by. I'm gonna sort it based off units. One, two, three, four. And in the sort order here, I'll do it in descending order. And I'm gonna close out the parentheses there. Now, as you can see, it's got, it's taken the list and it's actually sorted it using the units here. Better yet, I'll just control copy this information onto this piece. And now here I have, I'm going to insert Pretty cool, pretty cool. I do want you to pause the video and give that a try. The formula is right there. This is another one of those array functions that spill into the surrounding cells. There is another one that I wanna show you, but this time we're gonna use a very similar function, but it's called sort by, sort by. I'm gonna use the control and the page down option to flip the page and go over to sort by. Great, so it's looking like we have a list. Let me move this completed one a little bit over by adding in some columns. Here we go. And this list isn't sorted in any order or anything, but I do want to sort it by the age column. So I can do that by using a sort by function. Or I can select the list and I can choose the column I want it sorted by and the sort order, I'll do it in descending order with a negative one there. You can pause the video now and give this one a try, or you can wait till I show the final example, and you can give all three a try at the very end. There's one more sort by, but what if I wanted to do multiple criterias? This would sort by, I added in a region column, because sort by allows you to do multiple columns here. Let me insert a column and move this away. And this time I'm gonna do a sort by. I'm gonna select the entire range, my array there. And the first way I wanna sort it is based off the age in descending order. And then after I do that, I'm gonna hit comma and then I have a by array. I'm gonna also do it by the region. And I'll do a, a one there and I'll close it and hit enter. So first goes by age, then it goes by region. So the age will have the priority, of course. Let me go ahead and grab this information here and I'm gonna copy it there. With sort by, and I'll just grab this chunk here and I'll merge and center it. And I'll style it. So we've just gone through three different functions or three different examples with two different functions. The first one being the sort and then the sort by one just with one column. And then we use the additional with multiple criteria. I do want you to practice this, all three of them. And when you come back, we're gonna learn about something known as filtering.
And I'm not talking about this little drop down arrow that we see on some of these columns here. I'm talking about a function that we have called filter and the multiple variations that we can use it with multiple criteria, and as well as how to conjoin sort and filter together. Very interesting stuff here. Go ahead and practice these sort by and sort and sort functions with multiple criteria, and come right back. Another new release that we have, a new function that's been released is called filter. And here I have a list of sales transactions. I'm going to zoom in a bit. It's tracking the regions, the sales reps, the products, and the units. I can actually use a value from a cell to filter this list and return the corresponding filtered results. This is another one of those array functions where I'm going to use a filter and I'm going to select the entire array, the entire data set. And I want it to include, I'm going to select the product column, as long as it's equal to the value pair, which is found in G1. And if it ends up being empty, there's no values, just return blank. I'm going to close this and hit enter and I'll return the one pair value. And if I end up getting another value that gets changed to pair, it will automatically add it to this list as well. It has filtered this re results using the entire array, going to the product column and then searching for the word pair. Pretty interesting. Pretty interesting. Now there is another type of example that I'm going to show very similar in nature to this. But if you do want to pause the video and give this a try, you're more than welcome to. Now this next example is very similar, but what if we had more than one criteria? Maybe the product and the region is something we're looking for. So here I've actually done a filter, but this filtered list has two things it's filtering for. It's filtering for a region and a product. Let me explain how that's done here by deleting this and running a filter function and including the entire array just like I did last time. This time though, I have two things to select. I'm going to first do the products. If it's equal to this cell here. And then I'm going to put parentheses just to show association. I'm going to multiply it. They call this multiply, but it's really an operand. It's more of an and. How I see it is an and. I want to check for the regions to be equal to east. And here I'll put that in parentheses too. So this is an and of sort. Let me close out that extra parenthesis there. And when I hit enter, it return anything that's from Apple and East. So if I end up changing another one of these to Apple, and I change this over to East, it return both. I also have an option, just to let you know, to replace this asterisk with a plus sign. And that's or, as long as it has Apple or East, it will return that here. So you can see I have a banana product that was sold in the East as well. Very interesting, very interesting here. Just a recap here. We are learning about the asterisks, which looks like it's multiplying, but it's really looking for an and. That's what it's kind of doing, an and, but we just use the symbol. And instead of or, we use a plus sign. Both will work and both reproduce a filtered value, a filtered list of the results you were looking for. So in this small little brief video, we've covered three examples, or two so far. We're going to go on to the third. We learned about just the filter function. And then we learned about filtering with multiple criteria. 
Now coming up next, I wanna talk about sorting and filtering. So here on this sheet, I already have the example filled out, but I'll just move it over a little bit. Just move it over a little bit. And if I want, I can actually sort and filter a list at once by nesting things. Maybe I want to filter to show everything that has a unit sold over 5,000. And I want to sort it in ascending order. So I want a sort, a filtered list. Or I want to filter this list and include anything that's greater than this cell here. And then I'm going to hit for my sort after my sort index, the column I want sorted, I'm going to do number four. I want it to be sorted based off the units. My sort order, let's do it in descending order actually. Close out the parentheses, hit enter here. So here I've sorted the list based off units and it's only showing with 5,000 or more. Very interesting formula. It's a nesting. Again, we started out with nesting because we end off almost every example with a nested version of it. Go ahead and practice this. And when you feel comfortable, come back where we're going to talk about the let function. I have one more function that I want to cover here before we move on to consolidate and macros, and that's the let function which is pretty interesting because it lets you name things, assign calculation results to names, useful for storing intermediate calculations. So I can essentially let something be a variable name. I can call X the number five. And then for the third argument, I can use a calculation where I use that value X, which holds the number five and it will sum it let me close the parentheses, and it'll make six. So what if I wanted to filter this list to show me all of Fred's sales? And if it sees a blank, it's just gonna add a dash. So I wanna just filter the results for Fred. Now without let, it's gonna look something like this. I have to do an if, and I have to look if it's blank, and I have to filter this list. And I'm gonna filter this entire table. And I want it to include the rep name that's equal to Fred. And I'm gonna close out both parentheses here. And I'm gonna hit comma so that if that ends up being true, if there's a blank, I wanna add the dash. And I'm gonna hit comma and if it ends up being false, here I'm going to do a very similar function, another filter function. And for this filter, it's almost copying the same formula down again. It's the table. I'm looking for the rep. If it's equal to Fred, and I'm going to close out both parentheses there. So when I hit enter here, it will return all of Fred's values, including the one that didn't have a actual sale or a product that he sold. Now I can do the same thing with let, and this makes it much more human readable and easier to fill out essentially. Here I can let, I'm going to build a name called filter criteria. The filter criteria, the value of it's going to be Fred. I can hit comma and I can do another name or a calculation. I'm going to do another name. I'm going to call it filtered range. I'm going to hit comma. Now I can do a value 
I'm going to do a filter for the value. And I'm going to filter this entire list. But I'm going to filter it to include, I'm going to select the reps, and this is where I get to use the save name. So I'm going to do this for the filtered criteria. Notice how it pops up filtered criteria for me. I can close the parenthesis. I can hit comma. I can do another if. And if this is is blank, if there's another is blank for my filtered range, right? I have a filtered range that I've saved now. I can close that parenthesis. So if there's a blank in my filtered range, I'm going to hit comma. I want to replace it with a dash. If not, just return the filtered range. I'm going to close out this parenthesis here, and I'm going to close out this parenthesis here. And it's looking like I have either an extra parenthesis. It is. There we go. Cool. I just had an extra parenthesis floating around there. Now this returns the same result, but I'm actually using the filter range value and the filter criteria value inside of the formula. If I hit enter, it returns the same thing. So let essentially allows you to give names to values in formulas. And then you can reuse that over in the formulas calculation. You can do more than one. That's what we did. We named two. Practice this. I'm going to leave the formula on the screen so you to pause the video. And then come back for us to cover consolidate and macros. Welcome back. Hopefully you had fun playing around with those new functions that we've just covered. But I want to talk about a command that we've had for a while now, but it's a pretty useful tool when summarizing multiple sheets of data. So here I have a Connecticut division where we're tracking a few items, software training, maintenance, and miscellaneous throughout the quarters. And we also have formulas to figure out the sum of each column. And I've done the same thing for my main division in the same exact structure. And the New Hampshire. What I want to do is I would like to build a summary page that consolidates all three of those sheets that I just showed you into one page. Now, this is actually known, you can do it by hand, of course, but this is actually known by as consolidation, by position. The data in the source areas, these are the source areas, have the same order, and they use the same labels. These are the labels. We can use this method of consolidated to add from a series of worksheets that all are in the same workbook such as departmental budget worksheets that have been created from the same template. So here, let me build a summary division. I'm going to highlight the labels that I created, and I'm not going to include any blanks, and I'm not going to include any formulas. And inside of my data tab, I actually have a data tool known as Consolidate. And if I were to give a click on consolidate here, it's going to allow me to choose a function and I can add different references from different sheets in the workbook and it will run the function on them. So let me add my first reference, which would be Connecticut. And I'm just going to highlight all the labels, no blanks and no formulas, and I'm going to hit add. And I'm going to do that for all three sheets. So I'm going to do that for main. And because I've already highlighted it, it already picked up that. And all I have to do is hit add. And now if I click on New Hampshire, yet again, the highlight is already placed for us. It remembered that fact. 
and all I have to do is hit add. Now on my summary sheet, if you want the labels to actually show up and not be blank, I recommend to mark use top row labels so it doesn't replace it with blank values and use left column labels so that it fills it in with the new values that you're replacing it with. If you are concerned about these three sheets having updates, you can always link the three sheets to the final sheet. And when you link them together, if there's been an update, the update will also show up on the summary. I'm going to link these together here and hit OK. So now my consolidated summary sheet has added two different levels of this worksheet where I can expand and collapse the two levels. And when I expand to level two, it will show me the values it used in Connecticut, Maine, and New Hampshire to figure out the $1,500 expense for software we had in quarter one, and so on and so forth. So it's going to show these values being added. You can always expand and collapse these as you go along. There's my software. Now this is my training where I made 900. And this is more I can expand and collapse it. There's my maintenance. Collapse it. There's my miscellaneous and collapse it. And these formulas just filled themselves out as the numbers came in. Very interesting tool, the summary division, the consolidate tool we use there inside of the data tab. Allowed us to get multiple sheets of data. And we essentially consolidated it into one sheet. I just drew out the icon there. Practice this before we move on, everybody, to our final topic, which will be macros. Learning a little bit about programming, a VBA, where we're going to do small sets of computer instructions that we add in to the software. And it will just kind of alleviate those repetitive tasks that you have to do. So I want to end off this expert session talking about something called macros, which is actually by definition a small set of computer instructions. Now, don't get me wrong, we're not going to sit here and learn about programming and coding, although there is a coding aspect to macros. We're going to use something called a macro recorder to record lines of VBA. If you're wondering what VBA is, VBA is it's a programming language. But we can actually record ourselves doing things in Excel and it translates to VBA for us. All we have to use is the developer tab in Excel to record macros. So the first thing I want to show everybody in terms of getting sound with building macros is a great avenue to get into and it will lead to a world of possibilities. But in order to get to that world of possibilities, you must have a special tab in your Excel called developer. That's a tab that you have to turn on for each copy of Excel that you use. So on this device, if I needed to turn on the developer tab, if you're noticing you don't have yours, you would simply have to right click one of these tabs. Because the option to customize the ribbon will be presented to you. Now when I customize the ribbon, you're going to see it takes you to your Excel options with the customized ribbon settings open. And I get to choose this area that allows me to turn on the developer tab. It shows me all of my tabs, which ones are on, which ones are off. And I get to check mark the developer tab here to turn on. Once I hit OK, I'll end up having it. Now this developer tab gives me access to the set of tools that I need to actually record my macro, the code command group, as well as the controls command group. We'll be talking about these in just a moment, but first, pause the video. Make sure you can turn on the developer tab in your software before we go to record our macro. All right. Good stuff. Now that I have the macro developer tab turned on, I can record my first macro. Now, in order to record my first macro, 
Let me make that font size a little bit bigger for us. What I want to do is I want to record myself building a header where I get my first and last name, I get the company name, and I get the date, and I put it in the top three cells. I want to record myself doing that so in the future I can just run a command to add my header onto the spreadsheets. Let me start out by recording my first macro here. I'm going to hit the record macro button and I'm going to call it my first macro. And I'm going to use control shift M to run my macro. And I'm going to store the actual code of the macro inside of this workbook. A header. I could store it in another workbook. That way I can use it across multiple workbooks, but this is just an example that I'm running. Just saving it in this workbook and hitting OK. Now for this cell A1, I'm just going to type in my first and last name, Faz Kareem. I'm going to end up putting learn it for the company name and equal today, open close paren with nothing inside of it for the date. And I'm just going to hit stop recording here. So now that I've recorded this macro, I can run it. I can hit control shift M and it'll go ahead and run the macro. It doesn't matter where my cell address box is when I run the macro because I didn't use relative referencing. The code itself will always go back to cell A1, A2, and A3 regardless of where I run my macro. Now, of course, I can use the keyboard shortcut, Control-Shift-M, to run my macro. But most people forget those shortcuts, and they'll have to run to their macro library. And once they see the macro name, they can hit Run. And because I've recorded the macro in what they know and call absolute reference mode, I am always going to see it show up in cell A1, A2, and A3. I do have the ability here to do a different style of macro recording, or I can turn on relative referencing. And now when I hit record macro, I'm going to call this one my second macro with the control shift S for second. This is using relative referencing. And let me show you the difference between the two. So I'm just going to do the same macro, fast Kareem. I'm going to type in learn it, and I'm going to type in equal today. Open, close, paren, and hit enter. Now I'm going to stop recording the macro now. Remember, this is relative referenced. Now, because I've relatively referenced it, if I have my cell address box here, it'll be relative to where it was recorded. So if I end up running the macro, the second one, it's going to show up in these three cells. Where if I go to the first one, I'm going to go to the first one and run it. It's going to continue showing up in cell A1, A2, and A3. Now keep in mind that if you would like, you have the ability to use the controls command group and add a form control button. This can allow you to paste and draw a button on the screen to where you can assign one of the two macros you created. Pretty cool, pretty cool. Now be sure before you try this out, there is a special way you have to save this workbook in order to save the macro. Inside the file tab, when you go to save as, you do have an option to actually save this, not as an Excel workbook, but as an Excel macro-enabled workbook. This will ensure that all of the file types are correct so that the code snippets are actually saved. And if you were to send this to someone, they'll receive the code with it as well, the script with it as well. Cool, so I just saved that copy there too as a .xlsm file type that we have. I do want you to pause the video and practice building these two macros that we've just done. One being the absolute referenced, 
and then go back and build the relative referenced one and try to see if you can assign a form control to it. Congratulations, you've just completed Excel 2021 Expert. In this course, we did cover quite a, quite a list of new functions, mostly array functions, with these two interesting ones, the let function and the xlookup function that we got to see. And at the very end, we got a sneak peek and an introduction to macros, a very large world that we have to explore. Do stick around and stay tuned for our Excel 2021 XLOOKUP and pivot table videos. They'll be out soon. It's been a pleasure teaching this material and explaining it to everyone that hopped on and watched these e-learnings. I hope the practice reinforced the learning, those small little hands-on snippets where I told you to pause. If not, go back and rewatch the video and practice these things again. There is an exercise file in the chat. I do want to thank you for giving me some of your time. Be sure to check out our other videos and check out our website if you're interested in any other future trainings. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching. Don't forget we also offer live classes in office applications, professional development, and private training. Visit learnit.com for more details. Please remember to like and subscribe and let us know your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for choosing Learn It.